Welcome to Community Cocktails with Kimberly, hosted by Kimberly Woodard, a realtor for nearly 20 years with Ebby Halliday Realtors. Join her every first and third Wednesday of the month as she meets with the top community influencers to help you get to know the area you want to call home. Don't just love your home, love your community. And now, your host, Kimberly Woodard. Welcome viewers to this episode of Community Cocktails with Kimberly. I'm so excited because this one is such a treat. And of course you see what we're drinking. So we are here to talk all about wine with my friend, Tony. He is the Glen Eagles guru of wines and my go-to. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome. Thank you, thank you. Great to be here. Oh, I'm so excited. So you have an intensive knowledge and background in wine. And so let's talk about that. Sure. Uh, been doing the wine biz for about 30 years. I spent 28 years at the distributor level uh -huh. working in the fine wine division. So uh, these are all properties that are family owned, state bottled properties that have been around for 150, 200 years and been right. extremely fortunate to have traveled all over the world. So when I do talk about wine, I don't have to read uh, off a PowerPoint presentation. I've kind of had the live experience of seeing the soil, seeing the vineyards and talking to the winemakers themselves. So uh, right. last year I had an opportunity to come to Glen Eagles and manage their beverage program. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, and you probably know that we are the number one beverage and wine program in all of Club Corp. So yes. this presented great opportunities and, and great challenges for, for me. So, Well, and it's wonderful to have you because you're intense. I've been to your wine tastings and you just, no note cards. He's just going through everything that we're tasting and just amazing glasses of wine. But one thing, you know, as a consumer and a wine, you know, everyone wants to be a wine connoisseur but we all are not <laughs> and we you know and a lot of us are intimidated you know we kind of navigate to and it's kind of what we know mm -hmm. um what we're familiar with or you know what we grew up with you know um and it's hard for us to expand so let's talk about you know sure you know, absolutely you know wine can be intimidating yes but the greatest thing about wine is there is no wrong Everybody has different flavor profiles. Everybody likes what they like. Mm -hmm. We tend to get caught up within a lot of things of drinking the trendy wines, the right. Chardonnays, the Cabernets, the Pinots out of California and what our friends and, and family are drinking. Right. But we all like different wines. My wife only likes New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and sparkling wine. So if we're having steak, she's gonna drink uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. That is perfectly okay. Yeah. So that is kind of the beauty about wine is there is no wrong. Mm -hmm. Now. We tend to get boxed in to drinking Chardonnay, Cabernet, and Pinot Noir. I mean, when you go into a grocery store, you go into your, your local supermarket, and you look at the thousands and thousands of different brands they have, it does get a little intimidating. So right. uh, at the club, uh, it was very important for me to try to, and get membership drinking out of their comfort zone. Yes. So, you know, California has been doing the wine thing for about 60 years. Right. But if you go to France, you go to Italy, you go to Spain, you go to Germany, they've been doing it for two, three, four, five hundred years. Mm -hmm. But they don't necessarily label their wines as Chardonnay, Cabernet, and Pinot Noir. So that's where the difficult part comes in. Yes. So we started running flight programs. Every Tuesday I do a little pop-up tasting. Yes. It's four three ounce servings and I pick a topic. It could be wines of Spain, it could be Pinot Noirs from around the world, but it gives you an opportunity to taste wines that you normally are not going to taste. Right. Sometimes it's difficult to spend $18 for a glass of wine or $70 for a bottle of wine when you can't pronounce it, you don't know the name of the grape, and you have no idea what the flavor profile is. So when you're doing four three-ounce servings, it's a little bit easier. It kind of puts you you know, yeah. at ease and, and go, I didn't realize Spain made great white wines, or Australia did this, or, or, or uh, Portugal did that. So the next time you walk into a wine shop or walk into a restaurant and see a wine list, and hopefully you've tasted one of the wines that we have tasted, you feel a little better about about spending the money. Right. And it's kind of cool when you can impress your friends and, and try different wines that they may not have known. Okay. So one of the, you know, the other things that I try to do is, is, is dial in on your flavor profile. Mm -hmm. We want to ask four or five questions. You know, what type of wines do you like? And when I'm sitting down uh, with members who say, Tony, I want to learn about wine. I'll go, okay, let's do this. Let's buy 12 bottles, mm -hmm. spend about $200, and let's find the wines that you like. I can do it, or you can tell me what you normally drink. And the goal is to basically get you from here to here. So we'll, 
we'll taste the wine. We'll have you taste the wine. Take notes. Mm -hmm. What you like about a particular wine. More importantly, what you don't necessarily like about that wine. So when we go in to buy another case of wine or talk about it, I'm dialing in on your flavor profile. So the next time we go to purchase again, mm -hmm. we're going to get a little bit smaller in the gap and start dialing in on your specific profile. So if you like big, heavy Cabernets, tannic reds, we're going to stay in that world and we're probably not going to move into Merlots. We're not going to move into Pinglin Mars. We're not going to move into certain wines that you may not in enjoy. So, right. so that's the great part about it is it's, it's fun. You can, you know, you can find great values at 15 to $20 a bottle. Uh, you don't have to necessarily spend a hundred dollars for a wine. If you want that, we'll sell that to you. Right. But more often than not, when you're, when we're tasting blind and we're doing mm -hmm. certain tastings, uh, members tend to gravitate toward the wines that are the most affordable, which is the best thing. So right. it's it's easy to go out and spend a twenty dollar bottle of wine for hamburgers or pizzas or casual yeah. dining, and not have to feel like you have to spend eighty dollars every time you want a good bottle of wine. So right. uh, you have to do your homework. There's so many wines out there right now, there and lot. with the advent of the internet, it's very easy just to type in a certain wine, and you can get the grape variety, you can get the country of origin, you can find out where it's at. So it really helps to, to dial in on what you're looking for before you actually purchase it, or if you don't have me hanging around talking yeah. you through, this, through the process. Well, and that helps when you're going to the store, like um, you mentioned, you know, I'll go in and I'm like, you know, oh gosh, you know, like I dear light and dear head light, <laughs> you know, um, and I don't know what I'm going to buy. And I wander and I probably wander for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. wandering around like aimlessly and, you know, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to get? You know, I read, you know, all these little tags, but I really don't know sometimes what I'm even reading because I don't know what my flavor, sure, you know, absolutely. and that's, I think that's the great point that you have is dialing in to your flavor. So then when you do go and they have those little cheat cards of, oh, this one has, you know, is really crisp or apple or, you know, full body. Um, you already know, oh, I do like that. So I like it or I don't like that. So I probably won't like that mm -hmm. one. Well, the, the, the other part of this is you have to be adventuresome enough to move away from the California section yeah. and move into the European wines or move into Italy or move into France or move into Spain. Same thing with a wine list. You know, I like a wine list that has the Chardonnays from around the world mm -hmm. incorporated into that category. If I just did Cali California Chardonnays, right. you're going to go right to that. Yep. We like to put uh, a French Chablis in the mix. We mm -hmm. like to put an Australian Chardonnay into the mix. So there's so many beautiful wines. So at least if you're looking at it, you have a, there's a chance that you might buy one of these, what we call them old world wines right. that you may have tasted at one of the tastings. But you really have to be able to set yourself to say, I'm going to move into this section of the wine uh, program. Uh, and I think individuals who like to experiment with wine are natural foodies also. Yes. So we, we tend to like trying new things on the menu, whether it be bone marrow or, right. or, or uh, uh, pate or, or foie gras or anything like that. So if you want to move into that world of food, mm -hmm. you tend to want to gravitate the same way to wine because food and wine naturally go together. So, right. And you always want to try within the best of one's ability to match certain wines to certain foods. So, but again, I love California wines, but there's so many incredible wines out there. And lots of times if you're buying Melbeck from Argentina, yeah. or you're buying Spanish reds, which are Tempranillo grape. These are these are incredible values. They don't get caught up in the hype of of of, of the name of the wine that's right. going to push the price points, you know, the fifty or sixty dollars a bottle. So you can find incredible values for for twenty dollars and below. When I taste, I like to taste blind, uh -huh. and I like to kind of assess a value to X Y Z wine. So if I say this wine is worth you know thirty dollars a bottle, and they come back and say, well, to you it's twenty two dollars. That means that wine's over delivering, and that's what we want to try to yes. find is wines that taste greater than what they actually cost. And sometimes it's a hard thing to do, but right. if you can find those wines, it's 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 a great experience when you find those little hidden gems yes. and you bring these bottles to your friend's house mm -hmm. or you bring them to your the relatives for the holidays and right. you're not walking in with the same wine that everyone else has say here try this uh albarino the white wine from from spain try this syrah from australia right. you know there's so many great wines out there and once you kind of get your friends and family hooked on the process then they're going to start following your lead and i love you know, 
bringing something, you know, finding that hidden gem, those affordable wines, when you go to things, because sometimes, you know, everyone assumes it's going to be this expensive wine that mm -hmm. they can't afford. And then they're like, oh, I love this wine. But then they fall in love with it. But they're like, oh, you know, I, I, you just can't, you know, that's not something I would be able to afford to like have at my house um, all the time. Um, but the affordability, you know, the $20 some dollars a bottle, that's, you know, very affordable for people to have, mm -hmm. you know, in their paint, in their not pantry maybe it's in my pantry <laughs> but, uh, so um but again l love that because that is something i know you know myself buying for a family and bringing wines i always try and you know bring something that they um know and like and you tend to just navigate again mm -hmm. so i like to bring something especially with you know things coming up and we're all uh, maybe more having more social activities sure, um, finally yes and so that's a good thing and that you know people can go out and bring some different bottles and experiment mm -hmm. we uh you know it's it's low risk high reward lots yeah. of times we were doing a series of wine dinners every month we call them our passport series yes so we went to different countries from around the world we had a dinner I match the wines with chef's cuisine and a, a classic example of we did a Greek wine dinner right. and most people have never tasted Greek wines. You no. really never see Greek wines on wine lists or on shelves. No. And since we can sell retail now, uh, we end up selling about $2,500 in Greek wine. Wow. There was a white wine called Santorini that we were selling for about $52 a bottle. We oh. sold 30 bottles of that. Wow. Members were just amazed that this white wine from Greece tasted so good and huh. so you walk out of these dinners and and the, the the goal is did you walk out learning something that you had not learned or knew about previously about a specific grape or a specific country right. so that's ultimately the the educational piece of walking out of whether it be wines of germany or wines from australia france italy uh that you went well i did not realize that and have a better understanding so when you go back to that store or go back to that wine list you say been there done that i understand Right. why these certain wines have place mm -hmm. on a wine list. And I like to think that every wine on a wine list, there's a reason why it's on a wine list. It has right. some redeemable value. State owned, like I said earlier, family owned, over delivers from a qualitative uh, standpoint and just flat out tastes good. Yeah. So if you look at a wine list like that and say, every wine here should be good if I like a certain style of wine. Otherwise, I don't think it, sh it should belong on the well, list. So, yeah. Gotcha. Well, let's talk about um, the craze, and we talked to this um, before, you know, sugar. Sugar. And, uh, <laughs> as I take a sip of my glass of wine. This one's good. <laughs> so let's talk about um, sugar. You know, that's the big thing. Everyone's watching their sugar, mm -hmm. and they're like, now, you know, oh, do I have a glass of wine? you know, it has all the sugar. And then we're seeing, you know, wine saying, oh, we have no sugar, yeah. which there's. I, I think, you know, when you start drinking wine, you start off with maybe something that's a little bit sweeter. Yeah. Back in the day, you know, it might've been uh, a blue nine. There might've been wine coolers. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, white Zinfandel <laughs> was the craze you oh, know, 20 yes. years ago. Uh, but nowadays you've seen a resurgence of things like Riesling. You've seen a resurgence of things like Moscato. Yes. Uh, those have natural sugars. When we're converting, you know, uh, sugar and alcohol, you're basically fermenting the sugar out of the wine altogether. If we wanted to make something a little bit sweeter, like Moscato, we would keep that sugar in so when you're drinking chardonnay sauvignon blanc pinot noir cabernet most of the residual sugar has been uh, uh, uh fermented out okay so one of the big things that you know you find um customers looking at is sweet versus fruit flavors so this wine this little zinfandel right. you may say has some sweet flavors to it but it is bad pretty much bone dry. What you're getting is presence of wood, presence of oak, yep. black cherry, cigar, and tobacco. So, you know, when you're tasting uh, Sauvignon Blanc, you get a lot of citrus flavors. It right. could be a pink grapefruit, could be lemon, could be zest, could be hay, could be a little bit of vegetable. But uh, those are all characteristics of that particular grape. So presence of fruit, but no presence of sugar. Now, gotcha. wine has calories. Right. So, you know, you have to give up the carbs to yeah. drink the wine, yep. which is kind of my case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, 90% of what you're drinking from a varietal standpoint has very little sugar. And you do see a lot of marketing out there of, you know, wines that are vegan, wines that are lower yep. in sulfites, 
lines that are uh, biodynamic or organic and that's that's another topic to have uh at some point but i i wouldn't get caught up in in having wine that have a lot of sugar because okay. personally we don't sell that many wines that have that much residual sugar again unless you're drinking riesling unless you're drinking moscato uh, okay. and things like that so uh, yeah so and i'm a pretty much of a dry this is very good mm -hmm. this um this zinfandel very very good you know dry i did taste the bot cherries in it mm -hmm. um which i love um and just a very nice yeah, glass of wine. <laughs> Easy to drink. I mean, yeah. when you're looking for wine, you know, you have to say to yourself, you know, does it invite a, another glass? Right. Does it invite a second glass? If you if you're tasting a wine and it's too oaky or too buttery, and every time you have a taste, you, it kind of makes you step back for a second. Uh -huh. It's not that inviting. You want to be able to have a conversation, right. have a sip of wine, and just move right back into the conversation without letting the wine kind of take over. So yeah. it, it's important to find when you're looking to build a wine program to to find wines that invite that second glass without mm -hmm. you really knowing that. Wow, I just I just finished this glass of wine. Now I'm ready for another one. Right. Without you know getting caught up in and trying to figure out what's going on with the wine itself versus the conversation that you're trying to have. So. And I love that point because especially now we're coming again, holidays, gatherings, people are having people over. They want to have a nice glass, a bottle there that is inviting everyone, you know, to hang around, drink their wine, social conversation, and you know, partaking in a second. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> of course, we love that. <laughs> um, and so let, let's talk about some you know, favorite, you know, trends of wines that maybe people may not think about, you know, as holidays are coming mm -hmm. um, and all that does come. And we've talked about, you know, developing your, um, your profile, but what are some trends that you see, you know, with, I know, typically whites with turkey and stuff but sure. what, i mean maybe you don't want to bring again that it kind of gets back to whatever you like yeah uh, you know uh, dry rosés are are killing it right now and we get back to the white zinfandel yes. phase for about you know 20 25 years ago where it wasn't you know uh, really cool for guys to be drinking white zinfandel right. wines but you know the south of france and provence they've been doing this for 200 years and they make beautiful dry rosés and that's kind of the last thing that has come on board that forces a restaurateur or a retailer to add a section to the wine list right. or to add a section to the store set to start putting in dry rosés yes. so we all know well not all but you know the skin contact gives the wine color yes. so when you're looking at rosés on the shelf you have all these beautiful colors of salmons and pinks and things of that right. nature now these wines are dry they may have a little bit of residual sugar but to your trend toward the holidays i like rosés to kind of go with everything it'll go with yeah. pork it'll go lighter white meat dishes of course it'll go with you know uh, traditional white wine type mm -hmm. of foods um you know pinot noir is always going to work you know right. uh you know pinot noir again with ham turkey uh things of that nature where you, you do see uh, a big trend toward uh, mailbacks out of argentina okay uh, land is cheap, uh, vineyards are cheap, labor is cheap, so you're really finding some great $15, $20 wines coming out of uh, Argentina right now. Oh, so okay. uh, in California, uh, you'll see a, a growth in uh, wines from uh, Cabernets, especially from Paso Robles. Okay. Uh, Napa calves have gotten somewhat expensive through the years, so now we're kind of looking for, you know, uh, the good $25, $30 bottle of wine that we can drink out of, out of the California Cabernets, right. and Paso is kind of the, the, the next big. Uh, uh, area that we're finding. Gotcha. Uh, we're still uh, hoping to move the needle on sparkling wine and champagne. Uh, it's not just for birthdays and yeah. Valentine's <laughs> Days and New Year's Eve. I think there's nothing better than starting off a meal with a nice glass of sparkling or ending the meal with a nice glass of sparkling. I, I think we get too caught up in, in the celebratory fact yes. of of champagne or sparkling wine. And I mean, there's no, no different than drinking a glass of white wine or a red wine if you're on the patio, then have a glass of sparkling, have a glass of, of, of you know, champagne to, to start the meal. So uh, hoping to see, you know, that trend continue okay. to develop. And we are seeing more. We we sell a, a ton of Prosecco. Oh, yes. And I think that is a great starter wine for mimosas and by itself. Mm -hmm. But again, with any wine, as you start developing a palate, you start wanting drinking better wines. Yes. I, 
could that could be very good. That can be very bad for the pocketbook as you start developing and start liking these better wines. You're going to pay a little bit more for them. So uh, as you move into some of the better sparkling wines and champagnes, uh, it's not a bad thing, but it gets costly. It so. it does. I mean, I will say I'm one that I love. You know, my husband. I'll go to dinner. Um, we'll, he always will start with a cocktail. I prefer to start. Occasionally, I'll do a cocktail, um, but I like a, a glass of champagne. Yeah, That's absolutely. fun. I love to the sparkles. Um, I like a little drier than, you know, is what I prefer, mm -hmm. but uh, just because I'm going to start my meal. And afterwards, I think the sweeter, because you're kind of, you know, looking into those, you know, instead of maybe I'm you know, doing my dessert, which I do love my dessert, but if I'm going to have wine and champagne, that will count as my dessert. <laughs> well, you know, so, Sparkling is a little bit lighter. Yes. So yeah. uh, if you if you had a big meal and you want something just to finish off the evening with, yeah. a glass of sparkling because it's a little bit lighter. It's got a little bit of that uh, carbon dioxide. It's got a little bit of that finish to it. So yes. uh, it's a great way to end a dinner. Well, I'm going to have to maybe start in it. Yeah. Can we start in it? <laughs> no judgment. Next, next time here, we'll have sparkling. <laughs> And no judgment on the starting and the finishing because I like you know it's like bookends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, nothing wrong with you. No, well now so we have um we've got what we should be bringing. So I know for what I'm going to be bringing is some sparklings, mm -hmm. um maybe some rosés. I like rosés. I will have to say um to serve with the um turkeys and stuff. Um I'll have to do red because you know too because. My, um, my dad prefers reds, um, but I prefer um, a rosé, so I think that complements very well. And then definitely, again, back to the sparkles. Yeah. I have to do that a lot. And I think I'm going to do my flavor test. I want to do that. That's um, I think that would be even a fun thing to do, like like – you could do that like as a group you could all you know that's one of the things that are on the books for next year is doing some blind tastings yeah and, and tasting blind and not knowing are you going to get us a glass of red wine and it's up to you to, to smell taste and look at the uh, the color and kind of deduce where the wine is from what grape it could be and and maybe some age if you can give us a flavor pro profile so yeah. the goal is to get you from here to here so at the end of the night right. you're going okay i can now taste what new zealand sauvignon blanc is without looking at the bottle itself or right. i know what you know pinot noir is or i know what chardonnay is yes. so when you start developing these sensory you know uh habits it, it helps you so much better when you're trying to taste through certain wines especially wines that you are not necessarily familiar with you yes, start talking definitely. about oak versus stainless steel when right. in, when, in the aging process. And that's a that's a huge thing when you're talking about Chardonnays and Cabernets yes. of the world and tasting what is an oak-aged wine versus what is a stainless steel-aged wine. Still Chardonnay, still Cabernet, right. but the method of aging is completely different. So it cha completely changes the complexity of the wine. Huh. Sometimes you get a lot of people that say, I don't like Cabernet because they're too tannic, or I don't right. like Chardonnay because it's too buttery. Well, Chardonnay is grown all over the world and in different soils, different temperatures, different amounts of rainfall, different amounts of uh, aging mm -hmm. technique. So it's hard to lump in to say, I don't like Chardonnay because of this factor, i.e. too buttery. Mm -hmm. You just have to find Chardonnay that is aged in either stainless steel or maybe something that's less oaky. Okay. So to, to lump it all in as one, I don't like Chardonnay. Sometimes I, I have to talk individuals off the ledge and go, yes. give it a chance. Not all wines taste the same, so try other Chardonnays from around the world, getting back to let's buy a, a case, yes. and right. maybe let's buy six bottles of Chardonnay from around the world. Let's see what you like, right. and then you, maybe you didn't realize that you like uh, something out of Australia, okay. Chardonnay, or right. that you like the white burgundy, which of course is where Chardonnay was born. Uh, so right. everybody has a different technique. E each winemaker uh, works with what Mother Nature gives him. And so he's going to build the best possible wine based upon the soil, the wind, the rain, and uh, the, the specific grape. So um, I see a lot of people that get caught up in saying, I don't like Cabernet because they're too tannic. Right. But we can we can find some softer it's calves like that. that have some Merlot blended back into it. So it kind of cuts that tannic uh, uh, flavor profile. So uh, to be fair, give them all a shot. 
you know, it's, it's a, it can be a low investment and yeah. the wines aren't going to be bad. They just won't necessarily be your favorite, Right. but you're not investing $300 in a bottle of wine and go, Oh, I, I thought for three hundred dollars this was going to be phenomenal. More often than not, right. you know, you find the thirty, forty, fifty dollar bottles that are as just as good as the more expensive wines. Yep. So, uh, lots of times, it's 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 good to find that quality versus quantity range. Yes. So you get the best of both worlds. So I'm gonna ask you, what is your favorite go to? Um, you know, being in the industry, yeah. you know, I, I tend to like. Um, reds across the board okay. uh, i'd like white wines i tend to drink more higher acid mm -hmm. crisper clean mm -hmm. uh white wines uh sometimes chardonnays as i mentioned get a little bit too buttery too right. oaky and they get a little weighty it gets back to you know if this wine is kind of heavy in the glass it's going to heavy in the mouthfeel mm -hmm. am i going to order a second a, a second, second glass. glass uh love champagne love sparkling yeah um but you know we tend to love uh, what we call old world wines, wines from France, wine from uh, Italy. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more linear, a little less alcoholic. The yeah. wines have always been made to go with food. In California, the wines tend to be a little bit bigger, fuller, jammier, oakier. So gotcha. you kind of have to kind of figure out what am I, what am I doing with this particular wine? If I'm having a meal, I may want something from, you know, one of the old world countries. Uh, if I'm, you know, on a patio, obviously I'm probably going to yeah. drink something lighter, crisper, Pinot Gris, again, dry rosés and things of that nature. Uh, big heavy steak, you know, in, in Texas, it's a slab and a cab. So yep. we're going to dr <laughs> drink, you know, a, a big heavy, uh, you know, uh, Cabernet or we may go to Bordeaux uh, or Australia for Syrahs and things like that. So uh, to say you have a favorite, it's difficult. It depends on, you know, what, what you are mean? we doing? Are we yeah. having dinner? Are we sitting out, you know, on, on the patio? So er, I think every wine has a certain so, place for each uh, each uh, event. So you're not non discriminatory No. <laughs> well, I am going to challenge all my viewers that you guys should be doing your flavor test and uh, testing and go out there, get, you know, six bottles of wine or 12 bottles of wine and you know, experiment, experiment and really develop your flavor. Um, and we'd love to hear, you know, what you guys are, you know, what your flavors are. And then when you go to the store, or go to your favorite wine place, you can, um, you know, have more knowledge of mm -hmm. it and make all your friends um, say, wow, well, this has been so educational. I have learned so much. I know my viewers have too. Um, we are going to cheers, cheers and enjoy our glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to contact Kimberly with your real estate needs, you can reach her at KimberlyWoodard.ebby.com. We hope you enjoyed our guest this week. And remember, don't just love your home, love your community.